I'm Mark Marienzo from Stanford Libraries, and I would like to welcome you to Open to All, Creatively Imagining, Realizing, and Defending the Commons in Libraries and Archives. Our panel's five speakers, myself, Rosalind Metz, Shannon O'Neill, Thomas Padilla, and Eric Hanzi, will each be speaking for about seven minutes on how the library, archives, and museum sectors have used the rhetoric of the commons to further the work we do, sometimes at the expense of the commons itself as well as how we might envision a more inclusive and equitable set of futures for our fields and communities. I also wanna acknowledge the influence of Talia Cooper, who was involved with an earlier proposal for this panel for the 2020 Society of American Archivists annual meeting. I'll start with some quick remarks on what are the commons. The idea of the commons as a resource open to all users is central to our panel. According to Stuart Hodkinson, the commons are all the creations of nature and society that we inherit jointly and freely and hold in trust for future generations. Historically speaking, commons areas have been constituted as places such as land to which people have had a collective interest to write and right to use. The term has its origin in common land in medieval England, particularly as used for agricultural purposes. For instance, one of the most familiar forms of commons usage in an agricultural sense is the right to pasture livestock. Over time, access to common land became threatened by the process of enclosure in which it was appropriated either through the actions of its owners or through acts of government such as the Enclosure Acts in England. In a historical sense, when a commons is enclosed, people lose their common rights to the resource and resources were often physically enclosed through fences, hedges, or walls. The owners of these enclosed lands can thus limit the, their use for either themselves, their tenants, or others who pay for the right to use them. The loss of these rights led to a material impact on the commoners who relied on these lands for their survival. This enclosure itself can be more broadly seen as a form of commodification of the commons. While the commons was historically constituted as agricultural land, the use of the term has broadened significantly, including other forms of environmental resources, including fisheries and water, as described by economist uh, Eleanor Ostrom. However, they can also include other forms, of, such as those described by Holder and Flessus, such as the concept of global commons focused on environmental conservation outside of specific locations, and social commons, which are related to care work, such as child and elder care. Closer to the library and archive sector, we are familiar with cultural, historical, and information commons, as well as the notion of infrastructure as commons. While a convenient theoretical construct and rhetorical tool, the commons is in fact incredibly complex, and some of the usage in our sector aligns its ori origins and material realities. When we talk of commons, we may be talking about collections, knowledge, services, or systems in space in libraries, archives, and museums. When we invoke the, the commons, it may be a compelling idea, an ideology, or a very real and physical space. Neglecting the material aspects of the commons is one of the ways in which it can be depoliticized, and as such, we need to continue to bring any understandings of commons back to their material realities. Effective management of the commons itself is a highly contested field. Garrett Hardin's The Tragedy of the Commons speaks to the commons, the concerns of unregulated commons, and many have used his arguments to advocate for top-down management of commons. Eleanor Ostrom's work demonstrates examples of successful self-management of the commons by those who use the commons as part of their own survival. Writers like Peter Leinebaugh and Sylvia Federici invoke a notion of commoning, which views commons as an ongoing social organizing process based on community, reconciling what the division of so social division of labor within capitalism has separated. There are many more nuanced models, and each of them have an impact on how the commons itself is not only managed, but constituted. Before we get into the remarks from the other panelists, I will close by briefly noting why I think this is significant to us in the library and archives community. We often use the language and ideology of the commons to describe our work and, and professional values and mission statements like those of DLF situate themselves in terms of the public good and expanding access to resources and opening new opportunities for research, teaching, and learning. 
Within our sectors, the notion of the commons is understood as not only space and resources, such as digital collections, but also the infrastructure that supports these and other forms of commons. However, as we'll discuss, the realities of privatization and commodification are in interwoven into what we do. It's time for us to gather a deeper understanding so that we can more accurately understand how the commons can influence our work and resources and how they may be co-opted. And with that, I will hand it over to Rosalind, who is our next speaker on our panel. Hello, everyone. My name is Rosalind Metz, and I'm currently the Associate Dean for Library Technology and Digital Strategies at Emory. I'm going to start my portion of the panel talking about my framing for the commons as it relates to software and technology, which is, of course, my own area of interest. In particular, I'm going to focus on open source software. At many places I've worked, we have used quite a bit of open source software. It underpins just about everything that we technologists do. It's essential for everything from servers to websites to more complex applications and systems. And of course, many of these open source software projects come with robust communities. This is particularly true in North America, and my per own personal perspective and experience is very much rooted in academic library open source software communities like Sanvera and Fedora. In my time participating in libraries and their open source software communities, I've continually noticed that the perception is that open source software is largely made up of developers, users, and end users. In libraries, this translates roughly to library technology unit, library staff, in the university community. However, over the last few years, I've been doing quite a bit of research into this because my experience doesn't necessarily align with this perception. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the theories and research that I've explored in order to better articulate these differences. First, I'll talk about Eleanor Ostrom. For those of you that aren't keen on researching economic models, Eleanor Ostrom is a Nobel Prize winning economist made famous by her work on the commons. In her work, Ostrom posits that common pool resources are non-excludable, meaning that it is impossible to limit who has access to the good, service, or resource, and that they are rivalrous, meaning that consumption by one consumer prevents other consumers from using it. In Ostrom's work, she primarily focuses on grazing land and fisheries. Ostrom also talks about the different players in the commons. The first type of player is the provider. Providers are those persons who arrange for the provision of common pool resource. Next up, we have producers. Producers are anyone who actually constructs, repairs, or takes action that ensures the long-term sustenance of the resource system itself. Finally, we have appropriators. Appropriators are individuals who withdraw resource units from a resource system. Another researcher whose work I've combed through in an effort to learn more about open source software is Nadia Egbal. Egbal spent a few years working at GitHub and recently published a book called The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software this book was funded by the Ford and Sloan Foundations through their re research into um, open source software. Like Ostrom, Egwall posits three types of players. First up are maintainers. This group is responsible for the future of a project's repository or repositories, because it doesn't just have to be one. They make decisions that laterally impact the project. In some small projects, maintainers are most likely the ones overseeing development of the software. This can include triaging tickets, reviewing pull requests, maintaining tests, et cetera. In larger projects, maintainers can take on a number of forms. They may oversee a sub-project or they may have expertise that oversees the entire project. Next up are contributors. Contributors make contributions to a project's repository. Eggball discusses two types of contributors, active and casual. The former are considered members of the project based on their reputation or the consistency of their contributions. The latter are individuals who, generally speaking, have made one contribution or less to a project. These contributors are often less well known and may not have an affinity to the project. Finally, we have users. 
Users are those individuals whose primary relationship to a project's repository is to consume the code, but don't self-identify as contributors to the code. Generally, maintainers are unaware of who these individuals are, and therefore users are commonly referred to as the silent majority. You'll notice that users, as I described them earlier, are not included in this framework. So those users, people who use um, the end result software are completely absent. What's interesting is that these three types of players that Eggball establishes, maintainers, contributors, and users, match directly to the types of player that Ostrom identified in her work. So here you can see that maintainers map to providers, contributors map to producers, and users map to appropriators. Not surprisingly, Eggball dedicates a number of pages in her book to discussing Ostrom's research on the commons and provides for readers a brief overview of the design principles developed by Ostrom. Eggball also notes that Ostrom spent much of the latter part of her career applying these design principles to the digital commons of which software is one component. One of the struggles that I have with Eggball is that her focus is primarily on, it seems, contributors and users, as she defines them, not as I did earlier. She even goes so far as to categorize communities based on these two facets. And on this slide here, you can see her framework for categorizing communities. While I believe her framework for class and projects is important, I think what is more important is to focus on the work of maintainers. Maintainers, in my opinion, are the individuals that can make or break a project and ultimately end up doing the most work for a community. If we zero in on maintainers' work and explode it out, what we can find is that, in fact, they are running large organizations for little to no pay. None of the lit work listed here, um, design, uh, support, relationship building, administration, is easy to do. So before we move to our next panelist, I wanted to highlight some of the major takeaways as I see them from the research that I've conducted over the last couple of years. First, it's important to note that libraries are not the only ones working on trying to sustain open infrastructure. There are hundreds of researchers out there working on these various issues, and we would do well to take some time to get to know more about what they have learned. At the end of this presentation, I've provided a number of resources and I encourage you to take a look through them. Next, we must allow communities to self-organize. There have been a number of efforts in recent years to develop a new centralized funding model for open source software and libraries. Many of those efforts, however, ignore that these communities are responding to their own needs and we must honor their right to self-govern. One of the most interesting takeaways I had when preparing um, this talk was open source work is technology work. Now that seems pretty obvious, but bear with me as I try to clarify. Essentially, every time someone sets up an open source software project, they're effectively setting up an entire technology company. Now, some of these organizations may be small, containing a whole, only a handful of employees if you will. But some of these organizations are huge and can rival some of the largest tech companies out there. Think of the Linux community as an example. The reason these organizations are so complex is that the creation and maintenance of technology is complex work. And that leads me to my final takeaway, which is open source software is hidden and misunderstood because technology work is hidden and misunderstood. Too often we discount and dismiss the important organizational work that surrounds technology. We would do well to remember that technology is much more than just a thing to be used, but instead is something that must be cared for in order to ensure its long-term viability. Commons language is quite common across most academic libraries, but actual commons are quite uncommon. The rise of commons language within academic libraries took off around 20 to 30 years ago. This was the age of the information commons, a trend that merged internet connected computer labs with the library's traditional service points. 
In a series of reports issued between the late 1990s and early 2000s, library administrators and library associations widely promoted information commons as a way to ensure academic libraries continued relevance in higher education, where students no longer needed to browse the stacks, thanks to the trend of digital information delivery. In a 2005 CLEAR report titled, Library as Place, Rethinking Roles, Rethinking Space, featuring a variety of authors, Jeffrey Freeman described information commons in this way. Whereas the internet has tended to isolate people, the library as a physical place has done just the opposite. Within the institution as a reinvigorated dynamic learning resource, the library can once again become the center, centerpiece for establishing the intellectual community and scholarly enterprise. Although Freeman was an architect, other articles written by library leaders consistently characterized information commons as ushering in a transformation of the library from space to place. The library was no longer a warehouse for books. It was now the beating heart of where the university community came to learn and study together. Furthermore, the adoption of the information commons rhetoric included threads of the neoliberal transformation of education from a public good to that of a consumer commodity for the enhancement of job training. In a 2010 article on the relevance of information commons to millennials, Joan Lippincott of the Coalition for Networked Information wrote, the more that libraries can promote a close connection between digital content, technology, and academic and professional work, the better they can contribute to the education and job readiness of their students. In addition to the technology boosterism rife throughout the adoption case studies and white papers from this time, the information commons discourse also contains an almost complete absence of any discussion of the impact of information commons on library workers. In the rare circumstances in which library workers do appear in the information commons literature, they're treated with a consistently paternalist framing, characterized as troublesome or a barrier to the future promise of the information commons to keep libraries relevant to both students and university administrators. Information commons articles admonish library workers for everything from their territorial claims to their supposed resistance to out of the box thinking. So what was happening to library workers during the dawn of the age of the information commons. Well, in most libraries, they were disappearing in large numbers. Between 1989 and 2019, 80% of ARL university libraries had staffing decreases. These decreases were an average of 24%. But many were much higher, including 22 libraries that lost one third or more of their staffing since 1989. At least five libraries have lost more than 50% of their staffing during the same time period. And you can see the sorted list in this slide. When you walk into the main library on most university campuses today, you'll likely see these commons, a huge space in which to study or relax or buy a coffee. You'll probably see student workers at the service point, but you may or may not see a permanent full-time employee of the library workforce anywhere within the first several feet or minutes of your entrance. Academic library management engages in a form of pseudo commoning that evokes warm ideas about the commons, but without the visibility of the library workers who are the backbone of the library. These commons may offer many different kinds of technology or services, but more often than not, the commons and library spaces exist as a kind of technological terra nullius, an empty but resource rich space waiting to be populated by eager learners, innovative thinkers, or creative makers. The reason information commons is a form of pseudo commons is that most academic libraries are intensely hierarchical organizations. Information commons are not actually commons. They rarely demonstrate the characteristics associated with commons. Library information commons are a top-down phenomenon with little thought given to their ongoing governance. A 2004 ARL study of early adopters of information commons showed that the most frequently given reason for creating an information commons was a decision by library administration versus that of user demand or recommendations by staff. While library administrators may have consultative relationships with staff and student representatives, 
In most organizations, neither staff nor students have autonomous decision-making power over the library's information commons. The mainstreaming of commons rhetoric has coincided with deep austerity measures, both across universities and within academic libraries. As anyone who has ever engaged in academic budgeting can tell you, it's usually far easier to get funding for one-time purchases such as furniture or equipment than it is for salary lines. Furthermore, donors are often far more interested in putting their names on buildings than on endowing dedicated staff positions. Although academic library directors everywhere understandably face similar conditions of declining budgets, their lack of collective action to publicly name the problem of rapidly declining library workforces and finding ways to reverse this trend speaks volumes about their priorities as a group. This rhetorical construction of a pseudo commons has given library administrators political cover for a decades long erosion of academic library workforces. What then could shift library commons from a pseudo commons to an actually meaningful commons? History and commons research teaches us that managing the commons is often best solved by the people closest to the commons. If and when the lion's share of decision-making in libraries is decided by library workers and library users, libraries may truly become the commons they have long purported to be. And next, you'll be hearing from my colleague, Shannon. This presentation builds on a talk I gave at Drew University, which I've expanded with thanks to the feedback of my co-panelists. Similarly, the idea of commodified histories is not new, and I give my gratitude to Jennifer Ferretti, Ara Tanzi, Mark Madienzo, Jarrett Drake, and Aaliyah Brown, all who, whom have shaped, shaped my thinking on this topic. I came to my position two years ago, and I've been reflecting on what curatorial work means ever since. If, as Adrian Marie Brown says, what we pay attention to grows, what is it that curators are paying attention to? To whom are we accountable? And if curatorial workers abet the extractive forces of a hypercapitalist market, is it possible for the work of the curator to be re-envisioned in the defense of the commons? Curators have channeled their attention toward an international market for the buying and selling of archives. And yet there's little to know about what curators spend, literally spend as in dollars, their energy on. Processes around and budgets for collection development are completely opaque. Speaking about the research methodologies for her book, Placing Papers, The Literary Archives Market, Amy Hildreth Chen states, normally I cannot access sale acquisition information, it's private, so I can only access it if it was reported out to the press. Professionally, we have some indicators to measure acquisition budgets. Information Today publishes the annual Library and Book Trade Almanac formerly the Bowker Annual. I looked at their data specific to the category of academic library acquisition expenditures in five-ish year intervals for the last 20 years. The, the data demonstrates a lot of what is obvious, but the numbers for archives and manuscripts are intriguing for what they obscure as much as what they reveal. For example, the data does not bring to the fore the fact that in 2018, $244,461 spent on archives likely yields very few purchases, whereas $71,687,817 spent on books results in millions of purchased texts. Furthermore, what we examine here does not seem to include endowments, a significant budget source for purchasing archives. In a capitalist society, the wealth accrued in order to generate an endowment is almost always derived from exploitation and extraction. As Ara Tanzi pointed out to me, institutions like the Harry Ransom Center, the Getty, and the Folger Shakespeare Library were all forged in fossil fuel money. It's somewhat ironic then that in order to gain a glimpse behind the collection development curtain, I've had to look at annual reports from the Ransom Center. Admittedly, the Ransom Center is an egregious example as their outsized endowment is relatively unmatched. In their 2017-2018 budget year, the center's endowment made up 18% of their $10,173,452 budget. Nevertheless, it's illuminating to examine that of that 10 plus million dollar budget, 43% was allocated to acquisitions in the amount of $4,326,037. To whom are curators accountable? In short, our institutions. 
As noted by Dwayne Webster and Betty Sue Flowers in Community Forum, Research Libraries in the Digital Age, special collections have taken on the function of bringing prestige to their institutions. We might also note the growing trend of rebranding archives and special collections departments into distinctive collections, a marketing strategy mostly within higher education aimed at prospective students and faculty hires to indicate what sets one particular research environment apart from another. Curators don't speak of our budgets, lest we reveal where in the hierarchy of purchasing our institutions rank. In 2015, the Ransom Center purchased the Gabriel Garcia Marquez papers for $2.2 million, an amount that only came to light via Texas Public Information Act requests. Amy Chen writes that Stephen Ennis, the center's director, protested the release of this information stating, our competitive position is eroded and we can't negotiate without showing the larger market our vulnerability. Similarly, curators fear creating a hierarchy of commodities amongst records creators. Chen notes, once authors know what other authors can earn by selling their papers to repositories, they see that price as an anchor and are more likely to argue that their value is equal or higher. As a result, library directors and curators try to conceal the amounts they pay, partially to keep writers from negotiating their rate. Meanwhile, to whom are our institutions accountable? Our institutions profit from and accelerate gentrification that disproportionately harms black and brown communities and they have routinely failed to divest from companies complicit in human rights violations. As archives become distinctive destinations and amass collections worth millions of dollars, we've adopted systems of surveillance that enforce the separation of public and private. The first structures that one encounters when entering Volk's library are a set of turnstiles and a public safety desk. Nothing communicates more clearly that this is a private space. Curators have long positioned themselves as caretakers of collections. However, more accurately, we function as stewards, one who manages or looks after another's property. As we finally arrive at the point of acknowledging the harms and, the harms and violence of the archive, we must also rethink the role of the curator. Curators must begin as Aaliyah Brown taking up the framing of Saidia Hartman says, by undoing the plot. This undoing starts with acknowledging as Michelle Caswell and Marika Seifer write, that we are inextricably bound to one another through, through relationships, that we live in complex relations to each other infused by power differences and inequities, and that we care about each other's well being. Thus, curatorial practices must be centered in care, becoming relational rather than transactional. This looks like moving to the background and amplifying the work that happens in community. It means refusing narratives of productivity and prestige and taking up slow archiving as Chaitra Powell urges, or what Moya Bailey calls an ethics of pace. Curators need to hone our abilities as facilitators. We need to be accomplices in struggles for fair labor practices and acknowledge the impact our choices have on our colleagues who make accessible, process, preserve, and manage collections. Curators should reevaluate our relationships with vendors and look at the backlogs we have accumulated. Rather than pushing for new acquisitions, we should consider what first can be resurfaced in unprocessed collections. This work also calls for the necessary repatriation of dubiously acquired or outright stolen collections. This is what our undoing looks like. A piece of artwork created by lesbian firefighter and artist Jackie Berry that reads, less curation, more conversation. The work ahead of us isn't about meeting quotas, spending down a budget, bolstering an institution's reputation or centering the curator for that matter. Our work is to defend the commons by committing to practices that interrogate curation. And next you'll hear from my colleague, Thomas Padilla. Hello everyone, my name is Thomas Padilla. I'm at the Center for Research Libraries. Um, my contribution to the discussion of the commons and uh, enclosure uh, is to speak about more than infrastructure. Um, when I think about uh, enclosure and when I think about the commons, um, and when I think about infrastructure, um, conceptually, theoretically, I find um, Susan Lee Starr's work on boundary objects to be super helpful. Uh, a boundary object being a representational form, things or theories that can be shared between different communities with each holding its own understanding of the representation. Um, I think uh, to break that down a little bit more, maybe to be a bit more concrete, 
um, somehow, I guess, ironically, through the use of another metaphor, um, I think about a, a boundary object as like this um, merry-go-round. And if you've ever run into them, uh, perhaps as a child or, or, or presently, um, you know that um, they are a kind of a tool um, that can facilitate collaboration between people from many different backgrounds with many different kinds of motivation that have a, a general shared purpose in spinning this thing around. And we also know that there are limits to that collaborative activity. Um, and I think that a boundary object is basically that. We see that play out in DLF and other library communities where increasingly the notion of community or communities is problematized um, because you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's um, generative enough uh, and also vague enough that it can accommodate collaboration by a range of different communities, disciplines, et cetera, um, to move something forward. Um, but as we all know, even the best and even with the best intentions, uh, boundary objects can do only so much. Um, I think in a, in a broader uh, sort of contemporary context, we see the boundary object break down in the context of um, ethics and, a, and AI, ethics being the boundary object where it creates sort of this very um, uh, rich and honestly kind of vague space for a lot of different entities to sort of rise up and try and articulate um, kind of honestly individualized solutions to solving what should be a broad um, social challenge or addressing a broad social challenge. And you kind of have like this I'm Spartacus moment around you know, how to do AI ethically that honestly isn't super useful. Um, if we swing back to libraries, you know, libraries were cultural heritage, we're also dealing with the ethics and AI issue, but the focus of today is to talk about infrastructure. I think infrastructure is a similar kind of, of boundary object where um, I've noticed increasingly over the past five, six, seven years that infrastructure is invoked more and more and more in order to bring communities together, sort of, around how to solve um, challenges that are all sort of loaded within the infrastructure signifier. And um, I often experience this conversation as kind of like um, approaching an event horizon of a black hole, whereas you like you get close enough and you start to get spaghettified and like the more white papers you read and the more conferences you go to, it's just like you just can't escape it. And before you know, it, you're going to end up in some other dimension. But when you're in that other dimension, you're not able to solve any problems in your in your original dimension. So it's kind of kind of a tough one, right? That's not, not not entirely maybe useful at the end of the day. Um, Admittedly, infrastructure uh, as a boundary object is a thing to facilitate collaboration between us. Um, super powerful, yeah, especially because um, in the infrastructure challenges are real and are compelling. You know, Tom Kramer gave this presentation a few years ago at CNI, called it emerging verticals. Then I changed, exited out now and just changed it to verticals, where um, you see sort of market consolidation, not just around repository infrastructure, but a series of other pieces of infrastructure that support research. research. Um, and for a research library community, for the research community that isn't um, in a normative sense um, engaged with market conditions, this forces us to engage with market conditions and it forces us to engage with um, uh, infrastructures, right? But to me, when we focus on infrastructure is the primary boundary object to facilitate collaboration for the challenges that are in front of us, it creates um, some blind spots, right? So I just want to say that when we're thinking about enclosure, that of course we continue to think about infrastructure, but we must also think about our collections um, and we must think about the implications for you and me. So collections, for example, um, when we think about enclosure, many of us have been party to enclosing that which could have been open. In my new position at the Center for Research Libraries, I, 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 must, I must say that the Center for Research Libraries have been uh, party to making many things open, but they've also been party to making things closed. Um, and uh, increasingly, we will not do that. Uh, on infrastructure, for me, the scope of research questions are sort of arbitrarily demarcated by the resources of for-profit entities. Um, and in the great irony of our time, or one of the great ironies, there's many, um, many of these infrastructures are really constituted by a series of these, what I think of as like transmogrified open source tools. It's, it's really terrible. 
Um, and then finally, crucially, I think that when we tend to focus on infrastructure as, as the primary thing to bring us together, that it tends to elide discussions of people. And if we elide discussions of people, we've, we've lost the thread. Um, and we must maintain focus on the implications for, uh, for our jobs. Um, we must not allow ourselves to be commodified. Um, so I, I, hope, I hope this has been helpful and um, I hope that uh, it encourages us all um, to think about more than infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks for all for joining um, and we are all available for your questions and conversation. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you.